Welcome to another episode of the Common Babbler podcast. Here we deep dive into a series of conversation that discusses science pedagogy with a focus on how to effectively communicate science in an undergraduate classroom. I am Kalyan Chakravarti. I am an associate professor of biological science and chemistry at Kriya University, the School of Interurban Arts and Sciences. Uh, our guest today is uh, Professor Hari Babu Arthanari. Professor Hari Babu Arthanari is currently an associate professor of biological chemistry and molecular pharmacology at the Harvard Medical School and Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, professor Arthanari uh, received his bachelor's in chemistry from Madras Christian College and his master's in chemistry from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, now Chennai. Uh, he did his PhD from Wesleyan University, and uh, since then he has been at Harvard University, initially as a postdoctoral fellow, and then he joined independent position in 2010, and currently he is an associate professor at the uh, Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Professor Arthanari. Thank you, Kalyan. It's lovely to be here at Korea University, and uh, had a wonderful day today. Thank I'm you. Looking forward to this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I should mention that Professor uh, Arthanari is a very enthusiastic photographer and uh, he has traveled to some of the most remote places uh, on the globe to uh, and, and have taken wonderful pictures. And I think you have traveled to the Patagonia yes. and, and then to the Arctic Circle. Yes, also called Schwalbard, yes. Okay. And also the Amazon rainforest. Yes. What was your most adventurous trip? I would say all three of them had their their share of adventure, especially timing to the Arctic where the tallest plant is about a couple of centimeters and then that's a, a different type of adventure. And I was told that uh, I had to carry a gun uh, because of the, the fear of polar bears coming and attacking you. Okay. And I never used my gun. And I think if a polar bear had to come out, ask for five minutes time to <laughs> read the manual to unlock my gun to fire it, it, it but that, that's an, a different experience. And the Amazon was a, a very interesting experience. And I somehow had this naive idea that I'm going to go into a forest and I'm going to be in this peaceful environment um, or the forest and the birds chirping and the, uh, this yogic uh, uh, experience. It was anything other than that. Because the forest is another 13 meters water of uh, like this on, on the river. There's very few parts of the forest that you can actually walk on. And every inch of the forest, there's one species who's waiting to outlive the other. And then you walk across like spiders, tarantulas, snakes, um, uh, and everything. And then you're sleeping in a hammock in the night with a tarp at the bottom so that the mosquitoes don't bite you. And for the longest time, I didn't know how to sleep in a hammock. And apparently, you had to sleep diagonally and not um, horizontally. It's better support for your back. I only learned that the third day. And uh, in the f night, the forest comes completely alive. I mean, the sounds of screeching of monkeys, of things falling here and there, birds ramping is nothing but, but the species. And all those images that you have in your head of all the species that you saw in the night, your sleep uh, is, isn't, isn't that, that very good. But I would do that again in a heartbeat. I saw some wonderful, uh, really wonderful uh, vistas and really wonderful uh, experiences there as, as how to... I didn't know for the, for the five days that I was there, I didn't know what day it was, what time it was. Essentially, it was a, a complete blur of experience. And uh, there's one of the Patagonia was, was again, uh, another very interesting experience. Uh, we are walking on a glacier, it's 25 degrees Celsius outside, and it's just another uh, beautiful experience. I wouldn't turn myself as a photographer. I would like to call myself as a place, place, a person who goes to beautiful locations and takes photos, which makes me a photographer because it looks beautiful. But a good photographer, I think, would may make any situation beautiful, but I don't think I'm technically uh, there. So I go to beautiful locations and just take photographs, put it that way. <laughs> what kind of equipment do you have? What's your favorite camera? I used to have a, a Nikon, um, mm. and then I used to have, it's more on the lenses, uh, but now I upgraded to a, a, a Sony A7. Okay. And then, uh, again, I have a few different lenses. I like to take landscape. I have a 10 millimeter lens. Then what I figured out was like the iPhone now has a pretty much a 13 millimeter lens and it has uh, things. So the only thing you can't really control that is the aperture um, and the shutter speed, uh, which you can do to certain ex existence. So I normally carry my iPhone most of these day days. But if I'm going to some places where I can take a camera on the hike, which actually adds an additional weight to your to your mm -hmm. hike, then I take my Sony A7. 
Camera, I think if we can jump a little bit to uh, to your work, mm -hmm. I think you have some wonderful work in a um, technical aspect of spectroscopy, something called non-uniform sampling. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your lecture, I remember that you had a wonderful analogy with uh, taking photograph mm -hmm. and non-uniform sampling. Mm -hmm. Was the idea of non-uniform sampling, I know that the, I think the idea was around for some time, mm -hmm. but I think in your work you have really explored that mm -hmm. how the idea can be implemented. So was there any inspiration from photography that you, in your work when you were working in non-uniform sampling and thinking about the sampling schemes? In short, uh, there is not a direct inspiration from photography, but what I could, well, I'd like to step back a bit and to, just to say, where we use this concept called non-uniform sampling. It's, it's used in the something called NMR spectroscopy, which I think you're an expert and you've done uh, quite some research on that. So what we use NMR spectroscopy is to take molecular pictures. So essentially we derive the, uh, the architecture of, of molecular machines uh, using interatomic um, distances. If you take one of the molecular machines that's a protein, it's nothing, I say it is nothing but a garland of atoms suspended in space with some um, uh, uh, three-dimensional shape and we'd like to see how these machines look like. Rather than taking a static photograph of these, we use uh, a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance to record atomic signatures and then we not only get uh, a picture of how the machine looks like, we can also see how the machine moves. And uh, this particular technique, one needs to record atomic signatures. Essentially, we record uh, signatures that comes from atoms. Actually, more importantly, it comes from inside the nucleus of an atom. That's what we listen to. The, in the words of, I think, the Nobel uh, laureate, we listen um, to the magnetic melodies that the atoms produce. Essentially, you're li listening to the frequencies these atoms are singing in, in, in a different range, right? And uh, for us to record a bunch of frequencies, uh, what we need to do is that we need to sample them at a, at a particular rate. And uh, this sampling makes these experiments uh, very long because when we need to look at them at the higher resolution or, or higher, uh, the ability to see things very clearly to overlapping signatures, we need to sample them for long. And for proteins, that we take human proteins and we make them in, in bacteria, they need to, we need to exp uh, record experiments for a week or two weeks. And sometimes these proteins aren't very stable uh, for this entire period of time. Now the question is that, there are laws of physics that says that we can that say that we can have to record these at, at these increments to faithfully capture all the frequencies that exist in a particular bandwidth. Now, um, the inspiration for non-uniform sampling actually was uh, much before I got into the field. It was uh, from um, people who were working with radio telescopes. So the radio telescopes used to be in in places that are not very accessible to humans, just because you can get a clear signal. And there were chart recorders at the time, so essentially the, the frequency will be recorded in, in charts. But then when you have to, when the chart paper runs out, you have to go replace the paper. And sometimes when there's a snowstorm, you can't really can't go to replace the paper, so there'll be gaps in your data. Now the question is that people were wondering at the time is that can we fill these gaps uh, somehow with information that we have before and after? And there are theories that were based on something called maximum entropy or the, or the Shannon's entropy theory, that we can construct data from, um, from sparse um, uh, data sets. And I think there were people, initially a lot of people in the field were working on this, how we can, can we reconstruct um, Gerard Wagner, Jeff Hawk, um, there's a lot, multiple people that people I know of in Boston, but there are multiple people, people working on the, on the same idea. And then what we came to know, the entire uh, collective knowledge came to know is that you need not sample all the points. Uh, you can actually skip the sampling of certain points, which actually gives you a time savings. So essentially an experiment that takes about 10 hours to run now can run in one hour. And what we can use is that by sparsely sampling the points, you can now reconstruct the point. Now the, the analogy is that if you're reading Hamlet, if I could take every third word away, can you still get the picture of, that, of what Shakespeare was trying to say? And apparently the idea is we can, especially in this, in this particular case. I don't know if that's actually true in, in Hamlet. Maybe we should try that to see if you can take every... So that, that's the idea over here. And then um, and this is something that... The, now the question comes to, how many words can I take away? And what word should I take away? Should I take away every third word? Should I take away in random? So these... So what gives me the best picture? Mm -hmm. So let's say if I'm allowed to take only... Allowed to use only 10% of the words in, in Hamlet, which is the 10% of the word I should take? So these are the type of research that that, that we uh, um, that we my group and I started in, in the group of Gerhard Wagner's, we we started investigating it, 
we made some i think uh, asked some other groups in the in the community uh, have made a lot of headway into this so now we can we can record experiments much faster which actually gives us a window into um, the stable, uh, um, study proteins that are not even stable right. for a long period of time and we thought that we are some, doing something unique and then uh, this again uh, most of us are siloed into our own uh, research experience and uh, like this whole idea of sparse sampling exists in other things for example that's exactly what happens in your photo down samples so if you have a photo that is um, that is 12 megabytes and you down sample that to let's say 1 kilobyte so now the question is that what are the points what are the pixels you should remove so that you still keep the same um, image uh, the image quality, but how can you, how much can you remove without losing the image quality? So deeper, these are type of questions that have been asked by many of the photographic companies. For example, when you compress your PDF, mm -hmm. um, and and what what is the algorithm that you use to compress your PDF? How can you go from PDF that is twenty megabytes to one kilobyte or um, one megabyte, and how do you compress that? So these are the type of questions. They have similar um, answers. Coming back to your questions about uh, photography, I also think that NMR. Uh, the technique that we use to study these proteins and motion is, is like photography. So we take a molecular picture, and just as I change the lens, so for example, if I want to take a, a big landscape, I use a 10 millimeter lens. Mm. If I want to choose a, 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 a photograph as a zoom of a bird, I choose a lens that is that has a lot, um, like a 200 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. If I want to capture waterfalls, that is in a Milky Way, I open the aperture so mm -hmm. that I, I average out things. If I want to capture a baby jumping, then I have a different type of setting. Similar to that in NMR, uh, including the experiments that you have designed, we can design different experiments, what I call a different NMR lens, mm -hmm. to study a different action of the protein. Right. A protein could have motions in the femtosecond time scale, in the nanosecond time scale, in the millisecond, microsecond time scale. You change the lens of this, and then you can study all these motions. That gives you different information about the, how the protein should function. And for these things, non-uniform sampling helps us because now we can do these experiments faster, right. which means that we can uh, collect more number of scans to average out uh, samples that can be only accessed at very low concentrations because not all proteins can be concentrated. They're concentration limited. Right. So I think this, this technique, now we are talking about sampling 1% of the, of the grid in a 4D experiment. And I think this field is going to be... Um, going more leaps and bounds with the new developments in AI and ML, uh, I think we should, we could, we're going to have a lot more uh, fun with this. And that will also open up things that were previously not possible. Right. Since you brought the question of AI and ML, and I uh, was listening to this very interesting talk uh, by Fleming Hansen mm -hmm. that, uh, but I was wondering that if the idea is that one of the thing that in NMR spectroscopy one has to do is to transform the data and do the so-called Fourier transformation to convert the time domain data into frequency domain data. But it involves quite a bit of manual uh, intervention and that comes from experience to phase the line properly and to get rid of the water signal, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. I guess, uh, do you think that sometime it will be possible for the AI algorithms to jump all those steps of mathematics and learn that, okay, if this is the uh, signal in time domain, uh, do the transformation without doing the mathematical aspect of it. Just learning that, okay, this is, this is what the scientists like to see in this right. format. Can they do it? Yes, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities for that that, that we can do. That. Actually, there are some that are already in implementing right. uh, opportunities. But again, to step back at, at this, I always think of this problem or something right? like that. So what is Fourier transform? And I, I again, if I have to explain this to uh, a person who is not uh, initiated into the science, I'd say that if you're listening to a to a, a music, uh, let's say a rock band on your uh, mm. headphones, you get a, a sum of all frequencies. But your brain is able to tell you this comes from the lead singer, this comes from the bass guitarist, this comes from the lead guitarist, this comes from the drum, uh, and that's the deconvolution. Essentially, you're able to deconvolute a, a sum of frequencies into individual uh, components, and that's what I, I really think of Fourier transform. Now, coming back to the question, like if you're standing in a, in a, in a Grand Central Station or in, in a, a very busy street in, uh, in Mambalam and, and, you're t and you want, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of, there's probably some construction that's going, there's a huge noise that comes in between, but you're only interested in this uh, one noise of, of, of your child or of somebody mm -hmm. that you're interested in that conversation. 
how do you pick out that conversation? This seems to be most of what we're dealing with in, in NMR. Mm -hmm. You have this huge water signal that comes in, you have the, but the water signal is very predictive in the sense that you know where it comes. It comes yeah. at about 4.7. You know what the shape of the water signal is. Now the question is that can you remove that from uh, using an AI model? I think that's an easier problem. Now the question is that can you denoise your spectrum? And this question is that always our signals have electrical noise and the signatures from that. I think that's going to be a very interesting question. I think we can, but that again goes in the phase of physics because noise is supposed to be a completely random phenomena. Mm. Now the question is how random is random is, a, is, is, is I think it's more of a philosophical question is that the problem always comes in is that when the signal that you want to observe is as tall as the noise, now do you interpret the noise as a signal or the signal as a noise? Right. And that's going to be the, the million dollar question that, 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 uh, that, that goes on. But I think it'll do definitely much better in removing water. I think we humans are also a, a creature of habit. We're all interested in looking at time domain data the same way that our PIs and uh, uh, looked at it. But I think we can look at sorry frequency domain data. But mm -hmm. I think we can look at time domain data directly, which has. Uh, and I, but I think that requires a different mindset, mm -hmm. which I think probably I wouldn't get it, but my students might uh, might, might get it to look at time domain data directly. Mm -hmm. and um, extract information from that. So uh, I think AI and ML has, have a lot to, lot to offer here. And the only thing that scares me is that I don't know what it learns. And that's the part that uh, I was uh, a little reluctant to get in, but I think, I think nowadays I think we have to embrace it. It's, it's very powerful. Right. But there is still hope that NMR spectroscopists will have their job for some time in the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's always me. Is I, I don't think one could enter a field... Uh, if not for this, something else will come up. I think we should always, I think I, I feel like that we should embrace what's the next latest technology and then and then run with it. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, uh, one thing that you are employing the AI and ML is probably for screening very large libraries of drug molecules. And that has really benefited the, pro the scientific project because now you can have much more targeted experiments and I was really fascinated by your work, recent work on um, the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2, where you are screening these large libraries in a record mm -hmm. time, almost. So in, in this, we didn't actually use AI and ML. What we used was the regular physics-based docking, but we were able to leverage the computational power of large computing clusters that we have through commercial sources nowadays. I think I think gone are the days where we're doing things on a single computer. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays nobody even have a, has a USB uh, stick anymore. Everything is on the cloud. And there's a lot of resources that are, that are available uh, compared to what an, a single university or institution could have. And I think that's going to multiply and we're going to have more access to this. And if we can leverage it effectively, which is what the, the platform allows us to do, and some generous funding from Google in this case allowed us to computationally screen a number of uh, important actors that help the SARS-CoV-2 to thrive. And these are the proteins of SARS-CoV-2, and we're able to uh, identify machines that will block the activity of these proteins. And that's the stage that we are currently in where we have identified some of these molecules computationally and we are experimentally validating them that if they would stop uh, the growth of SARS-CoV-2. But as you know from here, to getting a drug into the market is a, is a pretty long road because of uh, bioavailability, toxicity, clinical trials and everything. But I think we will be ready probably with something on the shelf. Uh, hopefully for the next pandemic. I hope it doesn't happen, but if such had to happen, I think we'll be available for something that could fly off the shelf and uh, make this shorter. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> you mentioned in the in your research in um, looking at the SARS-CoV-2 uh, mm -hmm. virus that you were you had two main targets, and one is the RNA polymerase, mm -hmm. and the other one was the spike protein mm -hmm. of the virus. And uh, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point that on, on one hand, probably the spike protein is more prone to mutation. So mm -hmm. possibly that any inhibitor that is designed might mm -hmm. not be effective in the next iteration, mm -hmm. in the next mutation. And RNA polymerase is that way maybe less mutation prone, but it might have other complications mm -hmm. uh, in terms of possibly interfering with the other machinery. So mm -hmm. how did you strategize it? And how do you see that which side might be more promising as a mm -hmm. drug candidate? 
it is a very insightful question again. Um, there are pros and cons for both of them, and I'll probably explain um, either of them. If you take the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the spike protein is outside the virus, and the spike protein makes a key interaction with one of the uh, proteins on the surface of the human cells, and this protein is called ACE2. And this interaction is essential for the SARS-CoV-2 to enter the cell, and this is how the SARS-CoV-2 enters the cell. Now, if you can find a small molecule that blocks this interaction, now the virus is no longer able to interact. With the, with the with the protein that it allows for the entry, and that's one of the uh, efforts that we that we carried on. Now, let's say, as you rightly pointed out, the difference between SARS-CoV main difference between SARS-CoV one and CoV two is the spike the mutation of the spike protein, which makes it a little bit easier for the protein to enter and infect our cells. Now, if you have an inhibitor for this, this could be actually even a prophylactic. Essentially, what you can do is you can spray it on your nose. It need not enter your cell. All it requires to be on the surface mm -hmm. of it, and then now you're blocking the interaction. But now let's say if the interaction interface changes. Now if, the, if there's a mutation, now the small molecule will no longer be viable because that mutation has, has changed the shape mm -hmm. of the pocket on the surface of the spike protein and the small molecule might not bind there. Um, on the flip side, if you go to the RNA polymerase, that's the main engine of the, of the uh, virus. It replicates its genetic material and gives it the next pass to the next um, generation of the virus. Now, there are points that mutations can happen. Mutations also happen in, in these uh, proteins as well. But in the sites that we target, uh, for example, the functional, the active site, there can't be a lot of mutations happening in that place because if a lot of mutation happens, the protein is no longer viable. And in the, similarly, in the RNA binding uh, uh, domain, if there's a lot of mutations happens, the RNA might not bind. Then the mutation is not tolerated in certain parts of the protein. Other parts of the protein can mutate. So that's why we targeted multiple functional sites uh, out there. But the, as you correctly pointed out, the flip side there is that, the, first of all, the molecule should enter the, the virus, and then it should enter the cell where this happens. So the molecule should enter the cell. And this is a copying machine. It copies the genetic material. And we have our own copying machine as well. Now, the question is, it should be specific to the viral copying machine and not uh, affect any of the human copying machine. And these are some of the, the other constraints that, that we have. So the possibility of mutation in some of these functional sites might be very less because if it mutates, the viral would not be viable because it has to mutate and still retain the function. So the, on the flip side, then now your, your, your bar goes higher for this molecule. It has to enter the cell. It has to specifically inhibit this particular polymerase and nothing else. And so that's the two things that you, that you, that you weigh over. And can you want to have a drug that you don't mind if it doesn't even cross the blood-brain barrier? If it doesn't cross the sorry, doesn't even cross the, the cell wall, all you need to do is you can spray it in your nose before you get on a flight. Or do you want something that needs to enter? It also depends on when the treatment is happening. Are you looking to prevent? Are you looking to treat a person with the disease? So these are some of the other constraints that we uh, that we need to think of. I think both have benefits. But in case of another, for example, if there's a small variation, right, if you go from Delta to Omicron, these drugs might still still help if there's not a mutation in that particular interface. But if you go to a completely new um, virus, a completely new coronavirus, then the spike inhibitors might not work. Mm -hmm. And another project that you had described uh, from your group, where this was an effort to develop an antifungal agent mm -hmm. and uh, it was a wonderful story in which uh, you described that antifungal agent is had a short lifetime within the cell because the efflux pumps will take it and throw it outside mm -hmm. so at the same time you had developed also a blocker so that the efflux pump mm -hmm. was blocked so what what was the uh, strategy there so this is a, a, a project that I started as a postdoc in Gerhard Wagner's lab, a very close collaboration with the lab of Anders Nahr at MGH. So uh, this is a common phenomenon called multi-drug resistance. So the idea is that uh, we use drugs to seat a certain disease. The drugs normally go inside your cell. They stop a protein, uh, or some cases, nucleic acids from, from working. Now, let's say this is essentially um, a, a, a lock and a key. Let's say if you have a door that you don't want to somebody to open, you want to stop that open. You design a key that will go there and jam the door. It will not, it'll not come out, it will not uh, let another key enter in. This is a common uh, analogy that, that, that people give here. 
Now, there are certain phenomena that happens in human cells, even in cancer cells, by which certain drugs, uh, when given, either get metabolized into something that is inactive, I mean, cut into something that is inactive, or they get thrown out of the cell. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you give something, think of it, you give something, a child of food, and it just spits it up, similar to that. So this phenomenon is very well known in um, in um, humans, and this happens in cancers. There's a process called multi drug resistance, and there are multiple mechanisms by which this happens. So we found in the in a, in, in a fungi there is a uh, there's a similar mechanism. Again, uh, what we found is a molecular requirement for that mechanism. So how does a fungi know that, for example, a standard ant antifungal is ketoconazole or fluconazole? They call the azoles. They affect their gastrol pathway, and then the fungi is no longer viable. But what these fungi have, have learned to do is that they try to, uh, if you, for certain uh, type of fungal infections, they take the drug and then you just throw it outside the system. The way that they throw it is that they detect the drug. There's a particular transcription factor that detects the drug. Mm. It has itself a, a, a drug sensor, what we call the ligand binding domain. And once it detects the cells, now it says it sends off a bunch of workers. And these workers are called the efflux pumps. Then the efflux pumps binds to these drugs and then throws the drugs outside. Now the question we ask is that since we know what the molecular requirements of how this uh, transcription factor turns on the efflux pump, can we stop this using uh, a, a small molecule inhibitor? And this is what we call a protein-protein interaction uh, inhibitor because there are two proteins that are interacting to get a particular pathway going. Now if we can stop these two proteins from interacting, then we get a, a, a way of inhibiting them. Now we found a molecule that will disrupt this interaction. The most interesting to us was this molecule is not toxic to the fungi. But what happens is that if this molecule is co-administered with fluconazole or ketoconazole, it resensitizes them because now the pump is no longer active because it can't turn on the pump. Now fluconazole stays inside the cell and kills the fungi. So this is what we showed in the case of uh, Candida glabrata and the fungi, as well as the multiple mutants that are isolated from patients uh, with these diseases, uh, we are able to resensitize them to standard azole treatments. Fascinating. In the first part of your talk, you were describing the project in which uh, this is related to uh, brain and renal cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that uh, one of the therapeutic intervention was against an, something called an intrinsically disordered protein, mm -hmm. which does not have a structure. Mm -hmm. But very interestingly, when it finds the partner, mm -hmm. it forms a structure and dislodges the whole transcription machinery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was kind of the intervention. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did it, was it more effective as an intrinsically disordered protein because it can kind of sneak through in parts and then kind of form the structure and then uh, dislodge the transcription machinery? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a good question. So <clears throat> if you take the whole um, uh, the history of how we understand protein structure and how these, again, each of our uh, bodies have about 20,000 of these micro machines that pretty much dictate what our life is, it dictates how our hair is, it dictates how we digest the food that we, uh, that we eat. And they have unique three-dimensional architecture. And uh, this is what structural biology has been um, looking for about for the last 50 years. And, but what is new is that uh, I think the last 20, 25 years, we realized that not all proteins uh, are, are well um, structured. And the analogy I'd like to give is that, uh, for example, take you, you probably hit the gym 24 and you're very structured. And a person like me who doesn't hit this, she's a little bit floppy here and there. So that's, that's what the, uh, so there are proteins that do not form a, 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 a well-defined structure. Uh, what we call in uh, classical biochemistry an alpha helix or a beta strand, but they have an, a tendency to exist in multiple forms. Now, today, unfortunately, we put them all into one bucket and saying they are disordered. But there's a lot of granularity uh, in, this, in this disorder, a lot of uh, scales of, uh, of colors in this disorder. There are certain proteins, certain disordered proteins, that could exist in multiple conformations. So, for example, the main conformation could be, uh, could be a disordered region, but it could visit conformations that are, for a fraction of a time, that could form a helix. 
And this equilibrium between the disorder and the ordered conformation can be further modified by post-translational modification. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you can do is you can add a phos phosphorylation that can either take it to the order or the disordered region. And so, so I somehow think that proteins have, the disordered proteins have the propensity to form these structures, but not all of them. So I'm not going to put them all of them in a bucket. Now, there are two type of phenomenons that would happen. One is that there's something called a conformational selection. So essentially what will happen is that the binding partner selects the conformation that it wants. For example, it selects a structured conformation, thereby pushing the equilibrium. So that could be a one possibility that could happen. And there, actually, one of some of your experiments, like the ECPMG and everything, could, could, could help to understand what is the population of the species that is in this minor state, or what uh, Lewis Kay and others like to call the invisible state, because it's not, it's, it's, it's that low of a population, we can't see it, but we can indirectly get the information about, about those populations. And there's another type of mechanism where the disordered region has to bind into the ordered, uh, with the ordered protein, and then form uh, the structure. Now, both of these have their own uh, pros and cons in terms of energetics. Because if it exists already in a structured form, then you don't need to pay the entropic cost for the binding. But then you come pre-packed, essentially. But if it exists in a dis if it exists in a disordered form, it binds in a disordered form and then forms order, there's an entropic cost that you need to pay. But then there's also desolvation from the water that comes into the place. Because the desolvation, because when it exists in a, in, a, in a rather floppy form, there's a lot of water molecules around it. And when you form the structure, you lose in the entropy of the of the protein, the disordered protein, but the waters get out, and then that. So this is a much more complicated, uh, and there are examples of both. Mm -hmm. There are examples of conformational selection that is happening, and there's examples of uh, things where it is an encounter complex that is initially formed, and then the structure forms. So for these on and off rates are a good indicator as to what happens um, um, during this process, if the on and off rates are slow, then there might be an encounter complex that is forming. If they're fast, it could be conformational selection, but there are other ways that we can actually um, uh, study these type of uh, uh, transitions that happens in these polymorphic disordered regions. In the case of SREBP, we have done a few of these experiments. We don't think there's a conformational selection yet, but mm -hmm. still we need to confirm that. But in the case of the other protein that I showed you, which is 4EBP, people have shown that that, that helix formation uh, uh, exists as a, as a minor state, and there could be conformational selection that is, that is going on. But I think the conformational selection only happens in that for one particular place, but then upon binding, other events also could be happen, and that could be avidity-based interactions because you get one part of the protein, disordered protein bound, now the other part is right there, and it needs to fold. So it's a lot more complicated and a, and a, a, a system-dependent um, phenomenon that happens with the IDRs. And that's what makes it so much interesting. Yeah. I mean, we can't really um, say what they'll do. And that's why the systems also, the, the, uh, the cellular systems, use them as molecular rheostats. Because you can really fine tune the function, right? And you don't have to turn it off or turn it on. You can just like dial it up um, based on these things. A simple phosphorylation here, um, an acetylation there can dial up this equilibrium. And then there are systems that use multiple hierarchical for, uh, phosphorylation that goes from like as though you're turning your uh, volume button from one to two to three to four. And uh, there are systems that where the phosphorylation activates a the pathway. There are systems that phosphorylation inactivates a pathway. And all of them happen in an IDR. So that's what makes uh, the next generation of, uh, of protein uh, structural studies uh, very interesting. And probably the next generation of protein structural biology is out of trouble. They exactly, in the exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and especially uh, for, for, the, for the students, they just don't go to AlphaFold, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing that has, that has created, and then say, okay, we have, we have solved the problem of, uh, <laughs> of uh, protein mechanistic studies. I think AlphaFold has given us a lot to think about mm -hmm. um, uh, protein structure. Now we have very good starting points, but I think from there as to what the mechanism is still is, requires uh, uh, an individual case by case study to understand how these function. And that also gives us different ways to intervene when uh, instead of stopping a kinase by the same way, just acting the, the target side of a, of a serine kinase probably looks not very different. But if you could find other places that are mechanistically important, either PPI interaction, either interaction of the disordered proteins, that gives you more specificity to target a particular kinase and not the other.
I think you are the ideal person to have a view on this. I mean, so for example, when you are screening a very large library, there are of course uh, limitations as to what can be looked at. And you are mainly looking at the binding affinity. So that is the main score that you are looking mm -hmm. at. And then you have situations in which the protein binding might involve something like either conformation selection or induced mm -hmm. fit. Mm -hmm. Does the second question, the mechanistic part of it, uh, I mean, I guess that when one is developing therapy, when, it's, when one is developing a drug molecule, one has to consider it at some level. Mm -hmm. But the question is that whether when one is screening for the drug molecule, should one select for the major state or the minor state? Or if a state is invisible, then how does one even take it into account? Or is that even a... Is that even a feasible strategy? It is. It is, a, in fact, I would say it's a wonderful strategy. And uh, now let, let, let me, again, step back uh, a bit. So when what, what happens is that the traditional way that we do is that, uh, that we do drug discovery used to be that we identify a pocket, which is an Achilles heel of the protein. That could be an active site. It could be a protein interaction interface. It could be a cofactor binding site. And then we say that, can I make this process not happen? which is the cofactor not binding or the protein interface uh, uh, not able to engage a particular protein. But off late, uh, there are um, a lot of examples where a particular pocket in the protein doesn't occur without the small molecule. The small molecule actually sometimes creates the pocket. So these are called sometimes cryptic pockets. The pocket opens up. Uh, essentially, as you go into this, you can think about this movie, you're going into, you touch this rock, and then suddenly a door opens up. Similar to that. Um, um, so there are the molecule, the small molecule hits a part of the protein and a pocket opens up. Now you can leverage that pocket. That's very hard to do it computationally because you don't know what that pocket is and you know where to touch. Mm. Once you know that a small molecule touches and a pocket opens up, then you can leverage it. But a priori, that knowledge is, is not available to you. That's the first thing. Now, I think the second part of your question was, um, how do you design molecules that would specifically occupy a particular pocket? That's a, a much more, um, I'd say, much more involved question. Is that normally what we do is that when you're designing a particular molecule, we have one target in mind. Mm -hmm. And then we say that, does a molecule occupy this target? But nowadays, what we can do is that, especially with things like AlphaFold, we have the structure of almost all the proteins that are available. We can either do a computational screen to say that, hey, I know this molecule binds to this protein that I really like. Are there other proteins that this molecule could bind? Or one could do this experimentally. For example, if it's a transcription factor, then you can do something like RNA-seq to understand that, hey, are there other molecule, are there other transcriptional pathways that are getting affected at an RNA level? Uh, are there then... We can also do something like a thermal melt using mass spec, uh, the PISA, that shows that, hey, are there other proteins that are stabilized by this molecule inside the cell? This, if you have the ability to tag the small molecule with a biotin, you can do a pull-down experiment followed by a proteomics to see that, is, is my molecule binding to anything else? So these are some of the experiments that uh, that I would, I think you had another question which I probably missed it, but if I, yeah. So that was like, if there is an invisible state or a minor ah, state. Ah, yes, yes, yes. So that, that, that's, that's another very interesting question. Now, there is a lot of uh, uh, effort now using NMR to understand these invisible states. I think here I have to uh, mention an example of uh, Babis Calodimus, uh, the group at St. Jude's. They have identified uh, a very nice invisible state in, uh, in the ABLE kinase. Uh, and then the question is that if you can lock the protein in that invisible state, which probably in this case should be an inactive state, then what you can do is that you have an idea as to what you can what you can do. So the question is that, how do you know that get the structural information of that invisible state? Mm -hmm. Normally NMR gives you in most cases that there is an invisible state, the invisible state is at this particular population, and this is the exchange between the main state and the invisible state. In order to get structure, you need to get some nosy. It's not always possible to get the structure. In this example, um, in the science paper that uh, the Cloudimus group at St. Jude's presented, they had made some mutations to stabilize that invisible state because they know that the invisible state has certain features. Now they made some mutation to stabilize that invisible state. Now, in this case, when you have the structure, now they can also crystallize that or you can get an NMR structure of that uh, when, you, when you have stabilized it. Now you can use that to... to um, 
select for drugs. Or else you can do, if you have, it can develop some sort of an assay, maybe even an MR assay. Let's say, just take an example, you know there's an invisible state. All you need is your screening for fragments where the population of the invisible states increases. And then if you can show that the invisible state is actually uh, an inhibitory state, then you have a way to, um, uh, to drug that particular protein. Fascinating. Now the question is that where do you bind it and all these things are, are other questions. But if you get some structural information, you can also do use MD simulations at this mm -hmm. point. Because you know you have an alternate population and if you can run a longer, long, long enough MD simulation that goes into high microseconds or milliseconds and if you can capture that invisible state, you can use that information again to, um, to start um, uh, developing drugs towards that. So we'll change the topic a little bit. So in your career, you had been to, uh, for example, IIT Madras. And so uh, the types of institutions, so the Madras Christian College, which is probably a very broad uh, mm -hmm. education, then IIT Madras, which is a technology science mm -hmm. university, Wesleyan University, which I think can be characterized as liberal arts mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. And you said that you had a wonderful experience there. Mm -hmm. Then at Harvard, very high research uh, mm -hmm. uh, university, research intensive university. Mm -hmm. So I guess that every place had something to offer, but how did you like this uh, or what did you take from each of these steps? Or what did you like the liberal arts education? So as, as you rightly pointed out, each one of them had a different experience. And I, I think if I were to retrace my path, I would take the same path once again because I think each of them gave me something very different that I that I that I took over. Now, coming to the liberal arts, when I um, entered Westlake University, uh, as, as you know, the the education rather uh, in, in the Indian system is a, is a little bit more focused. So, when you are uh, a chemistry major, you learn chemistry, um, physics, and I never learned an economy. I never took an art um, a class in art history or something like that, and. Uh, when I went to Westlane, they gave they give you a placement exam so to see what courses that you need to take, and I didn't have uh, I, I aced that uh, exam because all I read when I was uh, here was chemistry, math, and physics, and it's an exam in chemistry. And then uh, the, the one of my advisors told me like you don't have any classes in the chemistry department you need to take, uh, but I'm sure you don't know nothing about uh, economy and, and art history. I think it's time you wisened up and and you start taking classes. And I took courses in economy, I took courses in music, I took courses in uh, um, um, computer science. And these were uh, golf, squash, you name it. I, I had an opportunity to take several different types of courses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I would like to probably point out to the famous uh, talk by Steve Jobs, when you can only connect the dots looking back, but you can't connect the dots looking forward. And uh, here, I, what I learned in computer science has actually helped me in uh, working with some of my colleagues here uh, in developing the platform and understanding the platform. And it also opened my mind up to completely different ways of thinking. How do you think about algorithms? How do you think about proofs in, in, in mathematics? And those collectively influence you as a person in how you're doing what you're doing. And these are some of the things I would really, um, uh, I think are invaluable in my life. Uh, and also the interactions with people, you interact with very different type of people. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So I was a TA for uh, my first semester and I was teaching uh, upper class uh, chemistry people. Um, everything was good. And then the next year I was doing a, a TA for a, a bunch of students who are taking chemistry as a non-major. Mm -hmm. So these are students from arts, from romance languages, and all these things. I was a little bit cocky, and I said, like, this is a basic uh, chemistry class. What can go wrong? And I went uh, um, rather unprepared. And one of the um, students, she raised her hand when I was talking about um, the concept of moles and Avogadro number. And then she said, uh, Avogadro number is a 6.023 times 10 to the power of 23. Um, uh, molecules uh, per mole. That's a very large number. How did Avogadro calculate it? Mm -hmm. I, I was baffled. I've known that from my 12th grade, my college. I never once self asked. I was just, okay, it's, it's one mole, 6.023 times 23. And none of the chemistry majors ever asked that question. Mm -hmm. It took somebody from an arts major to ask that question. 
I went back to the books. I don't know if you know the answer. And there is no answer. Like, well, there is no, how did Avogadro calculate the number? Mm -hmm. After a long time, I realized I, Avogadro never calculated the number. Mm -hmm. Avogadro's hypothesis, equal moles of substance have equal number of atoms or equal number of molecules. Mm -hmm. But it requires a little bit of different thinking. And, and this is what you'll get in a liberal arts school is that, uh, again, I can tell you more examples about this, but this is how people from different backgrounds um, look at the same problem with a different... Um, with a different mindset or a different vantage, right. and that makes it a lot more interesting. Right. Hmm? It's, I think in cricketing metaphor, it's like a googly. Exactly. Which is... <laughs> exactly. And you, you ask, you just think about it, right? You, right. you probably have known this uh, more than we use it right. in all our calculations. Right. One mole of... But how did he calculate? I never asked the question. I don't know why I didn't mm -hmm. ask the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Eric, it was it's, wonderful it's, having you here, and I'm sure that the results uh, from your lab and your group are much awaited. And thank you. Uh, thank all the best for your research. You always stand on the shoulders of the giant. So essentially, it's a, that's one beautiful thing about science is that it's not a singular entity. It's it's it's, it's an entity that is, builds on each other. There's some quantum leap sometime, and then again it builds on each other, and it reinforces the idea so that we come to the the truth. It could be a multitude of truths, but it's a multitude of truths that is uh, uh, reinforced by our peers, uh, and it. Um, I think it has a lot of positive things to offer society. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you uh, for your interest in science pedagogy, and we'll come back with the next episode soon. Thanks. Thanks.